Hi everybody, uh, I'm Tom from Pro Writing Aid and thank you for joining us for yet another session in the Ask a Book Doctor series. Uh, as ever, my guest for this evening is Sally OJ. How are you doing, Sally? I'm doing great. And look, we've got daylight. How about that? I know, it makes such a difference, doesn't it? It really does. Spring is in the air. It may still be freezing temperatures outside, but we do at least have yes, daylight. snow yesterday in Brighton. Good grief. Yeah, isn't it? Just crazy. Mm. Um, so tonight we are talking, the hot topic is beginnings and endings. So I'm going to start off with a simple question. How important is it to get the beginning of your book right? It's obviously absolutely vital. And uh, when we were talking about it the other day, I said, <laughs> I picked on you and I said, why is it important, Tom? And you gave you, the really obvious answer, which is, you know, you want to draw people in, you want people to be in growth. All that is, of course, absolutely true. But in the cold, hard world in which we live, vitally important that you get your, the beginning of your book right because that's what agents are going to see and make their decisions on so you have got to get your first three chapters certainly because that's usually what agents ask to see right but specifically you've got to get your first chapter right and even more specifically you've got to get your first page right because it's not unknown for agents to stop reading at the first page so you've really got to put everything you can into the beginning of your book. I mean, obviously, I'm not suggesting you then let the rest of it out, whatever. But, you know, the, the, it's so, so, so important to get the beginning of your book right. And there is a thing that many people here, I'm sure, will have heard of called the rule of three. Everyone heard of the rule of three? Anyone heard of the rule of three? Which basically is your first line your first page and your first chapter and then sort of so on for the next three chapters so for the first three chapters so then the first line of the second chapter the first line of the third chapter as well and those um that's a very very good guideline but the only trouble with the rule of three is that it can make really make people sweat and write not very naturally right. so you know, the, the first thing is always, always get your first draft down, get your first version down and then look to polishing. That's that's the thing to do. But but polish you must until it's perfect. OK. <clears throat> and so, excuse me, um, the, you know, when you sit down with a, a, a new client and, and you review a manuscript, how often do you find that actually the, the beginning is is lacking something is kind of it's it's not quite there and what's your advice you know how do you i i it happens a lot even in very good books um you know it it happens a lot that i'll start reading a novel and i never read the synopsis first uh, i don't want to be spoilt you know by by that yeah. and i'll start reading and i'll my heart will sink and i think oh no and then I'll actually, once I'm a couple of chapters in, I'm absolutely loving it. And it's a great, it's a great book. Yeah. I think people rely a lot on their experience as readers, where we all know that as readers, when we begin a book, if we're a bit confused or if we're a bit not grabbed or if we're a bit, we think I'll, I'll give it, you know, I'll give it a chance. I'll, it, it should all become clear. And, you know, 99% of the time it does. I mean, especially in a published book that's a very good assumption to make but you have to put the time you've really got to put the time into getting the, the beginning of your book right because it is a problem that I find comes up again and again and it's usually not too difficult to fix there's a there's a simple set of sort of do's and don'ts okay and um I happen to have them with me Tom great let's run through those I mean, this is just my my version of them. I think you'll find the same kind of thing online. Uh, you, I don't think I'm going to tell anyone here anything they didn't know, but it's good to reiterate because these are the things that are really important. And in a secondary way, obviously, you know, you want the beginning of your book to be crisp. So you want and you want some description and you want good language and you, you want to be showing, not telling, you know, that kind of stuff. That's important. But the, the, there are some some very basic things that you have to get right. The first thing is that you have to introduce your main characters or your main character. 
and you know if you if you are a uh, a lot of crime writers do this there's a crime writer called elizabeth george who i think never starts her book with her main characters it's always the crime it's always the setup and she gets away with that and with crime you can get away with it and i think if you're an established author you can get away with starting a book with someone who's not going to be very important in the story but really as a first-time author you want to start you want to begin with your protagonist okay. if you can and again i i hate in a way going back to the hobbit but it's such a good hitting all the right notes of what we're going to talk about because you know you've got bilbo you see his ordinary life you see his life as it is and then the uh, uh the um uh, god the the inciting sorry pardon my language the inciting incident happens and gandalf knocks on the door and then it, it all kicks off so i'll come to that in a minute so first of all introduce introduce your main character or characters just a little bit of, of just let us know. we don't want it overloaded with detail that's another yeah. pitfall that people fall into just let the reader know sort of subtly about their life what's happening uh, most importantly what what the reader needs to know is who they they need to really understand who they should be investing their emotional energy in for the duration right. so don't lead them sort of down a false path so right at the top of the story we need to get a sense of the important people of the important relationships in the plot or at least some of them and we need a sense of connection with them so that we want to read on so what what you have to do in the first page if possible is make the reader intrigued oh what's this what's happening yeah. you know what what what's in that letter she's reading what's what's what was it what why did they drop that box to the floor what was in it or you know that so something to make you want to turn the page i mean it doesn't have to be a thing but to get the reader intrigued is quite important to, to sort of draw them to the inciting incident which i will talk about in a minute so help the character help the reader to understand the character's motivation as soon as you can and again it's like it's like everything that i always talk about it's about caring for your reader it's thinking of your reader so uh, many many people i've had this conversation with so many people and they've said oh you know everyone knows that you're going to be confused at the beginning of the book everyone knows that it's going to take a bit of time and there is as i just said there is truth in this but why not just give your reader a break why not just be kind to your reader and 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 let them sort of enjoy the beginning of the book and not have to struggle yeah okay um a second golden rule is ideally for the very beginning of the book use action and dialogue for the most part when I say action, I don't mean, you know, hand grenades and, and spears, though, if you like, but, but just, I mean, people doing things and talking rather than yeah. a lot of introspection, a lot of inner world stuff right at the beginning of the book. You've really got to pull that off for it to work. Okay. So get your characters to talk to us, well, not to us, to each other, get them doing things um, and be aware again that you're writing to a reader. So one of the things I tend to say is don't don't spend too much time sort of sitting around a kitchen table and ever since I've said that I've noticed how many books start with people sitting around kitchen tables and it actually works really well but it, it's it's just what I'm saying is you know just you've got to pull people in so to so keep things sort of pacey and interesting T keep things tight and to the point that's that's important to try and avoid sort of lots of inner world kind of stuff and again you know, everyone here would be able to pull out without even trying five examples of very well-known books that start with, you know, somebody sitting alone and thinking. But ideally, you know, don't. And, and like you say, you can, you've got a bit more flexibility when you have an established readership, right? Re Definitely. When you've got an established yeah. readership, you can more or less do what you like. But okay. you'll find, you'll find that, that a lot of, readers will still prefer a, a sort of a traditional is that the right word I mean I'm talking about Elizabeth George there I'm sure a, a lot loads of people here are familiar with her the Inspector Lindley series I mean they're fantastic books I love her books and it took me a long time to get used to this yeah this sort of false start almost 
because what she does is she really introduces us to you know that it's not just it was six o'clock and the postman found a body you know we learn a lot about this postman and then we never see him again so yeah. it's very brave the way she does it but she's such a fantastic writer it it works well, so, it's a, it's a, i was gonna say so it's a good it's a good point to ask our, our listeners tonight or today rather you know who are your favorite authors when it comes to um, beginnings mm. who do you really enjoy yeah the first page or two because you know it's going to kind of grab you or, mm. or or be your kind of style so put your answers in chat if you've got some thoughts on that so um, yeah go on sir well so you want your you want your basic introduced to their world and we want to see at least maybe a hint of there's a problem coming a hint of something coming maybe you know the phone rings or mother calls up the stairs or a sort of hint that things are about to change and then you get your inciting incident now some people don't introduce the inciting incident you know until sort of chapter five but that's very brave yeah. everybody here I imagine knows what the inciting incident thing it's the thing that sets your story in motion the moment that disrupts your character's ordinary life the arrival of uh, of Mr. Darcy in Pride and Prejudice, as I just said, Gandalf in The Hobbit, um, yeah. the lodgers in The Paying Guests, or um, or the owl in Harry Potter. You know, these yes. are the things that that just sort of spark things off. Apologies to anyone who's thinking these are all. Uh, you know, I'm sure I could come up with much more exciting, but that's oh. what that's what your inciting incident. So once you've had your inciting incident. And still talking about your first chapter now, ideally you want, if not literally the start of the journey, and of course, if you're writing a, a fantasy novel or a historical novel, there, are, there often is a literal journey, but what your inciting incident should do is cause your characters to react. Yeah. So ideally in a way that's out of the ordinary for them. So they do set off on a quest or they do realize there's more to life than living in a broom cupboard, or they do um, decide they, they don't want to be a bank manager anymore yeah. so they embark on a sort of literal metaphorical journey the thing that's going to change their life and that's you know that's when the plot the story should really keep it should kick in and, and then it should keep kicking in yeah. so the inciting incident causes a thing which causes the next thing and the next thing and so on all the way to the climax of the story and then the denouement so keep your readers curious grab them from the first page um, establish your voice and the voice of the book that's quite important. And remember how important, you remember that you're selling your book on those first three chapters and you are quite literally selling your book on these first three chapters. And I, I did, you know, I should have saved it. But, um, one of the agents I follow on Twitter last week said, will I reject your book at the first page? Yes, I will, really? she said. And uh, she tweeted that. And I think part of it was to get a discussion going but it, it happens and it happens a lot. There's, a, a, there's a, a fondly held belief that agents will, you know, give writers leeway, will think, oh, it's not very good yet, but I'll give it a chance. And, you know, all this stuff used to be true 10, 15, 20 years ago. It, you know, it was certainly true. Agents had all the time in the world. The, 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 the industry was very stable. Everyone knew what was what and they could take time to nurture new authors. It's very rare now. Of course it does happen, yeah. but mostly they're gonna just, you know, do the agent equivalent of swipe right or left, yeah. I don't know which one it is, and look and look for the one they think is sexy. That's what they're gonna do. So you- I just to... made that up, that's very good. <laughs> I like it. Um, yeah, you, you use the, the term, I think when we talked about this the other day about, you know, seeing potential. So- yeah. In the past, they would have seen potential and, and, yeah. and, and nurtured you, like you say. I think um, that for me, uh, you know, as a, a non-writer, um, that's really interesting, though, the fact that you've kind of got two audiences to think about, your reader, but also, you know, your agent, because this yeah. is your lengthy elevator pitch, as it were. If yeah. You know. Yeah. yeah if you're if like we said if your if your elevator was in james and the giant peach yeah. it, it, but but it is it is your your set it's your calling card it's what you're selling yeah. yeah and we've had some great um suggestions about um uh, authors who start well 
or who you know who who, who uh start with a bang neil gaiman um stephen neil king. gaiman absolute king of it yeah that's stephen king uh graham green which reminded me i haven't read any graham green for years and i used to love his book so yeah, that's a great point the thing is about stephen king is he's another one who can get away he doesn't very often start with the main protagonist but right. he can get away but everyone knows this what's going on and everyone knows you know it, it once you're established once people know what's going on you can you can play all kinds of fancy games and I don't mean that disparagingly I mean that you know you you, you can and it'll work brilliantly yeah it's not that you can't as a new author but you've got to get it so right yeah you, you just can't there can't be there's no wriggle room you've got to get it absolutely perfect if you're going to do that so almost like give yourself a break of course, you know, yeah. you've got the whole book to be clever in. Someone, I, um, I think it's, uh, who is it here? Jack has uh, just mess it, mentioned in chat that, of course, you know, the shop browser will also decide whether to purchase a book within three pages. Mm, you know? so definitely. A really, really good point. Mm. Um, oh, I mean, and the publisher, you know, in between, you've got to convince the publisher. Yes. So, so if, you know, it's really important. Okay, fantastic um so uh, questions are piling up i i will say we, one sorry yeah, Tom, go on. i will just say one more thing if a book is published it's 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 gone through a process and as a reader we do trust if we're holding a published book in our hand even if like uh, the, the one thing that comes to mind is gormenghast i mean the beginning right. of that book is just brain mashing but we trust, we think this book has been published, you know, and it, it's going to come all right soon. And it does come all right soon. But, you know, that's the most, it, it's exactly the opposite of everything I've just said, the beginning of Gormgast. And that's one of the most beloved books in the English language. So, you know, it's not that you can't do it, mm. but you've, you've really got to do it right. And I, I'm not sure they'd let him get away with it now. I think they've cut out that whole first chapter now. I really do think they would. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Um. Should we should we to move to talking about endings? Um. Because again, uh, this is something that I feel quite passionate about because I, I've read a few books recently where I kind of feel like I've invested so much emotional time being taken on that journey, only to be left kind of feeling a bit underwhelmed or, or frustrated actually by the ending not delivering what I was hoping for. And, and generally that's because I, it's been left almost for me to make my own conclusion. I, I know yeah. that may be me, but that's how I feel about them. It, it's you and it's me as well. It's one of my absolute, I, I absolutely hate it if, a, if, a, if the end of a book isn't tied up nicely for me. Some people love it mm -hmm. and, and um, really enjoy the ambiguity, but but I always advise against it. And I have, you know, worked with people that I've had extremely full and frank discussions about the endings of some of their books. And sometimes um, I have prevailed and sometimes I haven't. And I mean, a, a book that I was talking to you about that I didn't work on um, is, um, I, I'd love to know what people here thought about the end of The Miniaturist. Ah, tell us what you think about the end of the miniaturist because i could have torn the book apart with my teeth when i got <laughs> to the end of what had been a wonderful book up until the last few pages i was i was outraged i i wanted to ring her up and and <laughs> ask what they, what she thought she was doing so and and that is and that is i think I mean, it's a hugely successful book, so I'm, I may be in, in the minority, but I also know many people who were very angry at the end at the end of it. And it's because it's kind of a mystery and you don't find out at the end what happens. And that to me is a crime. It's really outrageous. If you're leading somebody through a book and it's, they're not quite being able to work it out and they're not quite sure what's happening, they won't mind because they think I'm going to get to the end of the book and it's all going to be explained to me. So I will find out. Yeah. And, and um, if, if you get to the end of the book and it's not at least clear enough for you to make an educated guess, I think that's a very unwise thing. But there are readers who love ambiguity and there's certainly authors who love ambiguity. And, 
you know, I work with an author who, who loves an ambiguous ending, and that's Sarah Waters. And um, again, I'd be quite interested to know what people here thought about the end of The Little Stranger. Um, because for me, um, ah, now I've just seen somebody saying only to find out a book had a sequel. I don't know why I sometimes see things coming up in chat. <laughs> Mostly I don't. Now, you cannot, if you're writing, and that was, if it was a published book, yeah, that's really not good because if you are writing a, a, a trilogy, I think we've talked about this before, each mm -hmm. book must stand alone. Yeah. Each book has got to have its own arc. And you can't, I have this a lot with, with, with authors I work with, who they, I'll say, well, what happened to, you know, Susan? And they say, well, oh, it's all explained in the sequel. Well, that's not good enough. I need it explained <laughs> now. Uh, you, you know, you have to have every, each book needs its own arc and its, its own sense of closure. And it's fine to leave the door open for other, for, for, for an, another book. Yeah. But each book has to be standalone. Yeah. Um, and um, so that's a very important thing is, is lead, leaving a, a reader feeling satisfied, tying up all your loose ends. Yeah. The end of a book is, is pretty self-explanatory in a way. You yeah. want to tie up your, all your loose ends. You don't want to have any, if, especially if it, there's a mystery or something, you want at least the reader to feel that they understand what's happened and what's been going on. It, you need to answer any major questions that have been brought up and you you need a sense of closure or yeah. rather your reader needs a sense of closure. And the worst things are ambiguous endings which are left ambiguous endings because the author doesn't know what happens. And that uh, really shows. And that there, there are, I can think of several published books where I know that's the case, but for me, it really shows. And is that generally because Oh, I don't know. What's your what's your view, Sal? Um, do people is that because people haven't when they've started writing, they haven't actually finished the story in there? That's exactly right. That's yeah. exactly what it is, and it it really, really, really shows. Um, you know, I always I know that there are different schools of thought on this, but I always urge people to know what the ending of the book is going to be. You can change it. Yeah. But start your book knowing what the ending is going to be. You can always you might get halfway through and realize god they don't go to germany after all do they that's fine that's absolutely fine but start with a sense of where you're going because if you don't the reader is going to feel that that nebulousness and it's it's going to bother them just to go back again to to say you know the first of a trilogy obviously you're going to leave things to be picked up in in another book but if if you do that you've got to be it, they mustn't be things that scream out to be answered at the end of the book. It's just, it's, you know, it's as I said last time, use it, that's what being a writer is about. It's using your talent as a writer to make sure that people are going forward with perhaps, you know, what happened to that mysterious woman in the green dress? You know, what, but it can't be the thing that they're left at the end of the book thinking, what the, Yes. You know, what happened? So it's, 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 if you're, you know, you, it, ideally, if you're writing a trilogy, you, 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 you craft the trilogy, you know, you, you know, the plot of the three. I mean, isn't it true that J.K. Rowling knew, knew basically what happened all the way? She knew the whole story before so she. So I've heard. So I've heard. I love this. I there's a great suggestion uh, from Jay Reed in chat saying, I created a spreadsheet with every possible ending permutation and whittled it down to the ones that A, made sense and B, were more exciting. And it was yeah, fantastic. What you want is your reader to finish a book and go, that was fantastic. You know, I wish I could just start it all over again. Yes. I'm going to tell yeah. all my friends about this. Yeah. That's what you want. If you think about how you feel when you finish a book. Yeah. And, you know, we were talking about ambiguous endings. It's interesting that there are plenty of, I'm sorry about the traffic noises, that there are plenty of ambiguous endings that people think they get, and that's yeah. fine. Yes. And the, and the Little Stranger is a perfect example of that. Very few people I've ever talked to actually have understood what happens at the end of The Little Stranger, but nearly everyone I've talked to have thought they had, and uh, that's fine. If you think you've got it and you feel satisfied and feel happy, 
it's absolutely fine. So, um, okay. I mean, I don't want to single Sarah out. Plenty, plenty of people do this, but if if you're, I I, for me as a reader as well as as an editor, it, the the little stranger did not tell. It, it led people all the way through the book saying something is funny, something funny is going on here, or is it? Yeah. And it didn't answer that question at the end. So okay. for me, as Sarah well knows, that was that was problematic. Yeah. <laughs> but okay. apparently it's her book and she can do what she likes. Imagine <laughs> my frustration. <laughs> That's answered Amelia's question because she wanted to know why you you, you weren't a big fan of the, the ending. Um, we've got some great comments. Um, and I, but we we've also got loads of questions piling up, so I, I think we need to probably hit get me with some questions into some of those if that's all right. So I'm going to kind of try and answer these in order, but there are 21 questions to go through at the moment, so we'll see how we go. So the first person, and um, when you say first three chapters, how does that translate into pages for those who have long or short chapters? Um. A hundred. To be honest, I'm pulling that more or less out of thin air. Yeah. But okay. you, you, it, probably a difficult one. It, it is a difficult one, but not long chapters, not super short chapters. A sort of. Um, I think we all have an idea of what how long a chapter is, yeah. and, and that long. I know that sounds that's not very helpful. Okay. Well, and there's a couple of questions about this, Sal. So can you use a prologue as a way of starting without introducing your main character? Absolutely. If it's clearly marked as a prologue, that works really well. People do it all the time. And that's a great way of doing it. And then yeah. you, you kick off your book proper. And I should have said that. I'm terrible. I'm a false editor. I no, make it all up as I go along. <laughs> this is why we go through the questions. Um, Mary Lundholm, um, I may be misinterpreting your question, Mary. Uh, you said, what about starting with the, al is it the ally, A-double-L-Y, and the situation? I'm not sure I fully understand that. So if, if I'm misinterpreting that, maybe you want to repose the question, Mary. Um, uh, my guess is what Mary is asking is, can you start with an important character, but somebody who isn't the protagonist? Yes, I you see. can. That, yeah. that, that would be my guess. It, again, it's just a case of it's. If you do that, you've just got to do it really well because if if you start reading a book and it's about George, and you subconsciously think, right, this this book's about George. I'm reading a book about George. Here's George, and I'm investing in him as the character. And then eight pages later, you meet Jeanette, and actually, then we keep meeting Jeanette and keep meeting Jeanette. And at the back of your head, you're thinking, yes, but what about George, this, this book's about George. Now, that, obviously, this isn't always going to happen, yeah. obviously. So if you do start with somebody who isn't the main protagonist or somebody, you can start with the antagonist often. That will work, you know, the baddie. Yeah. Um, but it's got to be one of the main characters. And if it's not the person who's carrying the story, you've somehow got to make that clear. And I know that's very easy to say and not that easy to do, but you, there are lots of ways of doing it. Um, because otherwise you'll, you'll read it, I'm repeating myself, will just simply think, oh, this is, uh, this is a book about this person. Okay. So unless it very quickly becomes clear that it isn't, very quickly. Yeah, in fact, some, so it's kind of related. Someone says, uh, I understand to start with your main character or characters and motivation, but is it okay to have other main characters that come into the story as we move through the scenes and other chapters? Of course, naturally it is, but what you mustn't do in the first three chapters is pile up too many people. Yeah. Sorry, can anyone hear my cat meowing around? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> you, you mustn't have too many characters piling up right. in the first three chapters, just don't. And then again, Gorman Gast is, is the absolute anti uh, example of that, but, but just, make it easy for your reader just ease them in nice and gently and especially what I find a lot is somebody will mention somebody on page 20 and they don't turn up again until page 185 yeah. and I've forgotten all about them by then who's that I don't know 
I mean, unless you give them, we've talked about this before with characterization, unless you give them a scar or a beard or a hat or a nose, you know, something that we're going to think, oh, it's that bloke with the nose and the hat, you know, then, then, but really, of course you can have more, you, uh, I apologize because I think perhaps that's the way I explained it. Of course you can have more than your protagonist in the first chapter. Um, you can even have people who aren't going to be around for very long. But if you do that, I suggest, you know, even don't give them names if possible, yeah. because that tells us, you know, it, it's the maid, it's the doctor, it's the, yeah. you know, it, because if you, as soon as you've named a character, our brains go, oh, oh I've got to remember, I've got to remember uh, Dr. Faraday, really you know, I've got to remember. So, so if you've, if you've got other important characters, that's fine, but keep them to the to um, keep them to a manageable level. I, I it's love like, your it's like it's like you you know you wouldn't want to shove somebody into a you know football stadium and say here is here everyone is you know yeah. meet the gang yeah, yeah you know you take them round one or two or three four people at the time and and. Um, and do it that way. Think of it like that. Think of it like a football stadium. I, I do love your example, Sal. The one with the hat <laughs> and the nose. <laughs> you um, know the one with the hat and the nose. <laughs> so, uh, Daryl is a regular contributor uh, and asks, how important is understanding uh, genre tropes in how you set up the beginning? It, that can be a huge thing. And I did t touch on that slightly at the beginning. Yeah. Uh, as always, certain genres have got certain ways uh, the tropes at certain ways of doing things um you know fantasy are very common genres obviously you know somebody living a happy life everything's fine until suddenly you know their father is killed or dies or or the troops you know the soldiers run through the village or you know there's yeah. you know that's really really common and it's all right to stick to the tropes of your genre that's fine it's just what i said before when we were talking about fantasy last time you just yeah. have to breathe a bit of new air into it. Okay. Do you know what I've done? I've got my, I've got my, I haven't got my, you notice there's no tassels hanging ah. from my glasses today. And I haven't got my reading glasses on. So I'm having trouble focusing. So I'm not drunk. I'm just okay. trying to focus. That, that, that's good, Sal. It stops you getting distracted. Um, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> uh, Laurie asks, do you have any advice if you can't introduce your main character until chapter three? I introduce a secondary character at the beginning, but my main character is discovered in chapter three. Is this okay to do? I'm not going to say no. Yeah. Um, but you've got to somehow let us know. So, you know, what I picture then is, I mean, I'm sure this isn't what you've done or what you're going to do, but what I picture them is, is, um, is a you know a police room we're looking for this person we're, you know what's happened what's going so it's set up that the people that we're meeting aren't aren't the main person somehow somehow so the first thing that came to my mind was a sort of uh, something has happened and so the police are searching and so you can meet some secondary characters and but you you kind of know that it's not that or I mean I don't know what you're doing I don't know how you're doing it it's a, it's a little bit risky, but I'm always urging people to take risks. So as, as, as much as I always say, don't, you know, give yourself an easy ride and give the reader an early ride. Of course, sometimes you've got to stretch yourself creatively and that's really important. But the main thing is clarity. Clarity is so important. So you don't want anyone to be confused. So what you don't want is in chapter three or after chapter three going, oh, now, sometimes going O oh can be all right. Sometimes it's not O, oh, sometimes it's O. Oh, and that's very good. So yeah. it's, it's a case of using your skill as a writer to make it work. It, without seeing the book and understanding what you're doing, it would be difficult to say. Yeah. But by heck, give it a go. Um, Sal, <laughs> sorry, meowing cat still. Um, Letitia asks, and this is something about uh, working with agents, so maybe we should cover in a separate session, but... Um, she asked, speaking of agents, are there any tips you have on reaching out to one or picking one to reach out to? Now, I, th I think probably that's something for us to cover another time, maybe. Maybe. Uh, the, the most obvious answer I'm going to give is 
it's certainly in this country, it's, it, it is really getting hold of a copy of the uh, Artist and Writer's Yearbook. It is, that is really true. That is the way to do it. And you, you look um, for the kind of agents who suit your genre. I mean, Twitter, you know, people just, you've got to search. You've just got to search. Go for the, re for the agents who like your kind of book and and go on twitter you know and and follow agents because every now and then they will say my list is open um, so okay do that but if you see an agent who says their list is open make sure their list is is something that you've written don't just send them don't send them something yeah you know completely different because they might just love it they won't they'll just spin it okay and there's a great hint from Jay Reed saying uh, the uh, Artists and Writers Yearbook is available in reference section of UK libraries. So Absolutely. I was just going to say it's quite right. an expensive thing to buy. It's a useful thing to have, but because it changes every year, better yeah. go to your library. Uh, okay. and go through it. Quite a few questions about um, you know, the question, questions about uh, writing multiple books or multiple parts uh, or sequels uh, so I'm going to cover a couple of those now I'm writing a book about f I'm writing a book with four parts should I treat each part as a book with an opening and an ending yes yeah okay um, it's really important it's really important it's true that if it gets published and it'll say you know book one of the Norseman was here trilogy um yeah. that your reader will know that it's it's there are going to be other books but each book has got to have its own arc it's really important yeah. really important think of trilogies that you read they yeah. could all be standalone books it's really important but you could so some people are asking about leaving minor storylines for a sequel so yeah so that i said that you, yeah. you can absolutely do that but what you mustn't do it it mustn't be that at the end of the book you're going but that minor storyline, it must be, um, it must be a minor storyline that then gets picked up, you yeah. know, as, as long as they feel that they've got, a, a, as long as the reader feels they've got a satisfying ending, a, conclu a conclusive ending, that is, is very important. So Liz asks, how do you feel about not knowing the sex of the narrator? A book I'm going to read soon has this conundrum. Um, there's quite a few books like that, actually. I, I personally find it really frustrating because I personally find that I'm not focusing on the story. I'm just trying to work out if it's a man or a right. woman or, or indeed, as, as you know, an, an, another option. Um, so, but it's not, a, it's not an unpopular way to go. Uh, people do do it. And I think if you're going to do something like that, something pretty showy, something pretty flashy like that, you have got to have a reason for doing it if you're yeah. just doing it to be flashy it's a bit it's sort of a, a a trick a one trick pony that gets tired quite soon I mean one of my favorite books of the last few years was Milkman which is a bit of a Marmite book I right. think people tend to love it or hate it and throughout she never mentions the city that they're in or indeed the country that they're in you know, she leaves an awful lot to be filled in by the reader. And I think the reader does basically fill it in. But, you know, it's it's you can get away with stuff like that if you write very well and you write cleverly and you make sure that your reader gets actually gets all they want and they need. Yeah. But um... <laughs> <laughs> my beautiful cat who wants to be let out, I think I might have to let go and open the door in a second. OK. Um... So <laughs> I don't seem to be whittling down this part of questions at all. So I just, it's probably a good point to say to anybody, you are welcome to send your questions in after the session this evening. Um, you can contact us through our support channels at, at, uh, at ProWritingAid, uh, or you can find both Sally and I on Twitter. Um, so do that if we don't get to your question tonight. So um, Kirsten, if the main character and issue of the book is psychological, how far can you take a kind of self-talk at the beginning of the book yeah well this is what i was talking about it's it's not advised no um you can certainly get away with it for a couple of paragraphs without doubt 
if you if you go over onto the next page, it's a bit dodgy. If you go further than that, yeah, it's a bit dodgy. So I mean, I don't want to put you off. This is what I'm saying. Write your first draft. Get it all down there. Get your first draft doing, and then have a look at the rule of three. Is my first line strong? Is my first page strong? Is my first chapter strong? Just for the moment, just get it all down as you picture it in your head, as you want it to come out, and then go back and look and make sure it's it's all okay. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, I, I missed a question early on, and it's my difficulty is that I'm writing different chapters from different viewpoints. I have two main characters, one protagonist, uh, but a few chapters from the viewpoint of a third character. So the first three are from three viewpoints. The first chapter is a protagonist, though. Risky. Risky. Um, again, it's, it's, it's not unusual. Yeah. I think if you're starting with your protagonist, give it a go. Why? I mean, give it a go, because you're going to have beta readers. You're going to have people who look at it. If they all tell you they were confused as heck, then it's not working. Yeah. So, so give it a go. I think if you're if you're starting with your protagonist, and it's then very clear that you've changed changed to somebody else, and then very clear that you've changed to somebody else again. Mm. Um, but it's again, you see, it's it's piling up a lot. It, you're back in the football stadium. It's like it's like here. This is um, this is where you know this is. The part of the stadium where this happens and oh but by the way i'm going to take you to another part of the stadium now and this is where this happens got that right now we're going to another part of the stadium it's where this happens so it's 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 just uh, i mean done well it can work i i can think of several books where, where it's done like that yeah. and again genre you know crime it's a very common way of 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 chopping around um just make sure it works just really run it past your beta readers and right. and make sure it works and remember um beta readers are prop i'm talking about proper beta readers who possibly don't know you because yeah. you know your friends aren't going to give you an honest answer really yeah um this might be one for our listeners to to contribute to in chat but uh, maureen asks how do you demonstrate that a character has Mensa level intelligence? Carefully. Right. Because what you what you don't want to do is start, you know, having them sitting there and well, I mean, actually that would be a way if they if they finish the cryptic crossword in four minutes, um, then you know what you're dealing with. But you know, you mustn't shove too much, don't shove too much, it's got to be subtly done. Don't shove too much. I mean, look at, you know, well, I can't remember now how Sherlock Holmes starts, but um, no yeah. one wants to be sort of beaten over the head with with one yeah. fact after another about somebody. You know, you again, if you meet somebody and they start telling you everything about themselves, you think they've got autism and you, and you back off a bit. Yeah. Um, I hope nobody took offence at that. There's nothing wrong with at all with having autism. But what I'm saying is, if if somebody, you know, there are sort of social norms, is what I'm saying. Yeah. And yeah. and um, so if if somebody meets if you meet somebody and it just all blah, comes pouring out, you back away. Well, it's kind of like that in a book. You drip, drip feed this stuff through by chapter three or chapter four it's going to be perfectly clear or you can have somebody you know be careful of exposition always be careful of exposition and information dumps but you know you can have somebody referencing it after a while what you don't want somebody saying is hi George you I you know it's lovely to see you uh, how's that mental level intelligence going <laughs> you know that's you, you you want to avoid that if you can yeah okay okay um so I asked a beta reader about my multiple POVs, both heroic and villainous. He said he was able to follow due to proper handling of voice. And he said the characters all work well towards the plot. I'm reaching 150,000 word count and I'm wondering if I should do a dual release, hero and villain, or if I should simply trim word fat. 
Any thoughts on that? My first thought is you've got to cut. Yeah. You've got to cut. Um, how you do it is is entirely up to you. It's it's how the plot works. But but if you've got that far and you're not even finished, you've you've dramatically got to cut. I'm yeah. sorry, I know that's harsh, but you really have. Um, okay. Think of your reader, think of your reader, think of your reader. Yeah. And when you finish doing that, think of your reader. So we're going to have to rattle. We're going to have to rattle through these now, um, because as fast as we get through them, they, they're coming in <laughs> faster. So um, any advice for two POVs? So chapter one is female, chapter two is male, because you actually have two beginnings and two inciting incidents. That sounds good. That sounds, sounds really good. interesting. Go um, OK, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to pick some of these. Um, Romance and other love stories tend to have two, sometimes equal protagonists. Do you think starting with one, the man or the woman, is more helpful than the other in terms what, of... What, you mean male or female? No. Just, yeah, okay. just start with one. Yeah. yeah, I mean, very often you'll have more than one protagonist. Just, just make sure that you... Well, as a general rule, make sure you start with one of your protagonists. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, if writing subsequent books in a series, how much of the previous history needs to be given at the beginning of the sequel as you maintain each book should stand on its own? Well, that's for a, a prequel. You know, a lot of times it will be done in a prequel. Yeah. Um, you just don't want to... You don't want a huge information dump in the actual novel. So, again, I urge you to look at your favorite trilogy and see how they do it. it, it it's, it's, you can, my favorite trilogies, they just let you, they just let you work it out. Yeah. And, and you can, and they, because they're well written, you do work it out quickly enough. Um, my book is a family saga, main characters are mother and daughter, but the daughter is the main in the first person but doesn't get born until the end of the first part of the book. Is that okay? Um, without seeing it, that's actually quite difficult. Instinctively, okay. that's too late. Yeah. Instinctively, that's too late, but I would, I would have to see how you've done it. I think yeah. then I would suggest starting certainly with some kind of initial chapter or prologue with that, the daughter's voice and then going back in time, perhaps. Yeah. But that's, you know, I, that, I have not seen the book, I don't know, but instinctively it, it, that's much too late. Yeah, okay. but, but, but please don't let me put you off because you might have it really well worked out. So, okay. So uh, it's another question. The main character needs to evolve and overcome a flaw. What techniques are there to not make them too unsympathetic to readers from the beginning? It's well, it's all right if someone's un it doesn't what we want them to be is interesting. And what we yeah. want readers to, you know, lots of books start have got protagonists who are who, who evolve over the story. Yeah. Um, you know, you can give somebody a sense of humor, or you can give somebody a vulnerability, or you can give somebody, but but mainly you as long as we're interested, as long as we think, you know, I've just did a I've just worked on a book where the one of the main protagonists is an absolute bastard, but you you keep reading because he's interesting. Yeah. You know, and and so I think as long as he's as long as you're it's the reader is invested one way or another. They might want to see him get a kick up the arse. Yeah. You know, that might be what they want to see. So as long as, as long as they're somehow invested. So I don't know what's happened to my language today. <laughs> Brilliant. I didn't say that. Um, another question for, the, for chat. Uh, I think we're only gonna have time for a few more, but Helen asks, can you give examples of any books or authors with particularly great endings to these? Ideally fantasy, myths and legends, etc. Now. Uh, if anyone has any ideas and would like to contribute in chat, please help Helen out with some ideas. Be useful. Um, um, 
I would go for Rebecca, which is none of those genres. Okay. Uh, that's got a great ending. Um, it's got a fantastic ending. Um, and now my blind has gone blank, so sorry. But I'm sure loads of people are going to be bringing stuff up in, in chat. Yeah, I'm sure they will. Um, okay, let's have a look. Uh, I like more suggestions on endings. What makes a good ending? Maybe we need to do a whole session on just on endings. Yeah, the trouble is that people have got very... You know, I've got very strong feelings about how I like my books to end, right. but other people don't have those strong feelings. So the important thing is to make your reader feel safe, that you've guided them properly through the story. They've invested in this story. They, they've they trusted you. So don't break that trust at the end of the book. Tie up any loose ends, answer any questions. And and what you, like I said, you want the reader to close your book and go, that was brilliant. So to do that, they need to have a sense of closure. Yeah. And I mean, we could try doing a session on, I'm not sure, well, we could, we could try doing a session on ending your book, but I think it, a lot depends on more, much more than the beginning of a book, a lot to do with the ending of the book depends on personal taste. Yeah, It really does. So some, well, there are some basic rules, which we really have covered here. Yeah. Um, let's go and try and squeeze in a couple more if that's okay. Mm. Um, Amelia asks, uh, this is quite an interesting one. I've been advised recently that every story needs a narrator and my story is lacking because I don't use one. Does every story need one, either implicitly or explicitly? Um, not in a, I wouldn't put it in that way. Every story needs a character who's carrying the story. Right. That, that's important. And that can sort of, you know, it can, there can be a sort of baton that's passed on, even if you do it really well, um, you know, in a split narrative. But somebody must, without doubt, be carrying the story at all times, like the Olympic torch. Yeah, OK. Um, one of my books started with a description of something harrowing. The characters there were negligible but it was about introducing the beastly nature of my character and a glimpse of the fantasy world and why humans hate them. It was a short scene and it scared the beta readers enough to stop reading, but some liked it. Should I rewrite? Listen to your betas. Listen to your betas, okay. Listen to your okay. betas. I can't, I can't really judge. It's, as I said earlier, fantasy very often starts away from the main protagonist. But if your beaters are going, ah, then, and more than one, if, if three of your beaters are not liking it, then I would consider changing it. Okay, right. Sal, I think we're gonna have to draw it to a close there. It's been a great session. We have had a couple of suggestions in Q&A about whether we could do a session on synopses uh, and also do a session on multi-viewpoint and how to balance structure. So things to think about um, for the okay. continuation of the Book Doctor series, which would be great. Um, well, maybe maybe other people could send in other things they'd like to, you know, why don't why don't we ask now? What would you like to hear about? And then we can we can pick the ones that are most popular. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we, we have I think we've got plans for the next three or four, haven't we? But beyond that. So please do send in your suggestions for what topics you would like Sally to cover. It's all Sally, not me, because all I do is ask a few questions. Um, but let us know how we can help. We, we've loved running the first 10 of these sessions uh, and we'd love to carry on. So um, please do uh, send us your ideas. Um, Sally, I wanted to say a very big thank you uh, as ever. Really great talking to you. Uh, it's, been, it's been an absolute pleasure. And again, to everyone here, thank you so much for joining in. That's what makes these sessions. I'm sorry if I've been squinting and rolling my eyes a bit, but um, I don't need to see you to know that you're there. Well, Sally, you won't have seen that we've had more than, uh, more than, uh, I, can't, I can't get my sentences out tonight. Are you <laughs> sure you haven't had a drink, Tom? <laughs> more people than ever before joining us this evening. So oh, big that's thank great. You to absolutely everybody from wherever you joined us from. Uh, we hope you got a lot out of today's session uh, and have a great day wherever you are. And we look forward to seeing you again in a month's time. Indeed. Thanks very much, everybody. Bye. Okay, bye, -bye.